Hello, Hello. everybody. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello, welcome. In case anyone's new here, this is the channel box. This is where we stream um, animation feedback, usually on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays between me, Daniel, and Cynthia. And then on Saturdays, we'll have interviews like this today. So today we are interviewing uh, Taylor Gessler and Robert Lanning, the animation power couple. <laughs> so we're going to talk to them a little bit about what they do. And um, you've had questions before. So if you have any more questions, we have kind of a list of questions that we're going to ask them that we've compiled beforehand. But if anyone has any more questions as things come up, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll watch the chat and make sure that your question gets answered or at least somewhat answered. <laughs> we'll figure it out as we go. So. Um, yeah, just to introduce Taylor and Robert, if you guys want to just kind of give us like an introduction about who you are, what your animation journey is, where you're at now, where you're working, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Robert. Uh, I am, uh, I originally uh, come from uh, Austin, Texas, where I'm from. Um, I started, um, I started my animation journey at um, Animation Mentor. But uh, before that, I started um, kind of teaching myself uh, all, all about animation. Um, I started animation with uh, Minecraft, <laughs> as funny as, as it is. I, I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to, uh, to create series and all the things that were, that were in my head. And the only way I could think to do that was to uh, make make these things with with minecraft because minecraft is just there's so much uh like machinima and animation in that and so i i i picked up that that game and started to make like machinimas with it and and then that became not enough for me i wanted to do performance i wanted my characters not to have this blank square face so i i figured hey i'm gonna try animation it can't be too hard but but before that, I tried to get you know a whole bunch of other people to do it for me. So I sent all those cringy emails that you probably I'll probably get out that are saying, "Hey, do you want to come work for me for free? Do you want to like um, uh, animate on on a cool project?" <laughs> and of course, no one responded. Literally, no one. So so I then was like, "Okay, well, I guess I'll do it myself. It can't be that bad." And I was wrong. So that struggle of creating of creating all of these these things by myself uh led me to animation mentor because i was like well i should probably learn from a professional and at that time you know every everyone that works in the industry is just a god to you because you know i i saw uh these animators who had worked on my favorite films how to train your dragon uh zootopia all these things that inspired me uh and i was like you get to learn from these people what and <laughs> so so i made the choice to come to, to animation mentor and that's uh actually where i met taylor because we happened to sign up for the same class one um so my animation journey took me through uh animation mentor i went through all the classes one two three four five and six and then by by the end of that i was uh accepted into uh a Disney animators mentorship, uh, Nara Yoon. He's an uh, amazing animator at Disney. He's had a long career at DreamWorks and Disney. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience to learn from him. Um, and then uh, then after that, I was uh, actually, I, I started looking for, for opportunities and, and jobs. And Funny enough, the first job that I landed was a return back to Minecraft with with a big uh, a big uh, Minecraft animation studio who who makes Minecraft animation for YouTube. Um, and I thought that was uh, amazing full circle to my my career from beginning to to finally starting to get my foot in the door as a professional. Um, then. Uh, that that uh, gave me the experience that I needed to uh, to move more towards the uh, uh, film uh, film animation. So because I was able to do so much volume at at this uh, with this Minecraft animation stuff, and they actually let me do my own layout and my my own cameras, and I was I was getting so much repetition 
uh, so quickly, I was able to apply for a position at the third floor, which is previs, which is all about camera animation and uh, and you know quick uh, but effective animation to just get the point across. And uh, it was it was like a, it was a really cool uh, leap. And uh, right around that time, Taylor was had been accepted to Disney, so we were already moving to California for uh, for her to work for Disney. And so it just seemed like the like everything was coming together. And so I worked at the third floor for a while while I also uh, worked on my reel. Um, and then uh, the opportunity uh, came after I started to get a little bored of previs just because I want I wanted to do full uh, full finals uh, for screen animation. And so I put my reel out there again about six months into working for the third floor. Um, and I got I got interest from a studio called Luma Pictures, and they make uh, amazing uh, VFX for for mostly uh, Marvel movies. Um, they do a lot of other other projects, but uh, from what I've seen, Marvel is their their biggest client, and um, and that's where I've been uh, ever since. I've been working at Luma Pictures, working on some really awesome awesome features. And um, and yeah, that that's currently where my animation journey is. I'm uh, I'm right now. I'm a VFX animator uh, on some some really cool feature films, but um, but I'm uh, in the process of of still working on my reel and moving to uh, more of a cartoon animation, which is which is where I want to be. But yeah, that's that's a my journey as an animator and i'm still very much at the beginning i'm still very much uh just my foot in the door of of trying to get to the big studios yeah. and somebody in the chat just said that they've seen your name in enchanted mob and cubicle studio videos so yes we have a couple minecraft fans in the chat yeah. I'm, I'm in one cubicle <laughs> one cubicle video yeah <laughs> I had uh, Taylor come on, and then I wanted to be the the most famous, like the the Minecraft animator with the biggest career, right? <laughs> I wanted, to, and then I brought her. I made the mistake of bringing Taylor on, and then she gets hired at Disney. I'm like, well, I'm not the most popular. I'm, I'm no. not the most prestigious Minecraft animator anymore. I so, think I was uh, already hired. I was just like waiting to. We were. I don't know. It was around the same time. Funny, but. Yeah, I think you were waiting to hear back from them. That was the last time you recommended Taylor for a job. He was like, no, no more. Yeah. I was like, she's already now, out. Done he, me in the mind. No, he did better industry. than me. I it's a it's hard going from like human rigs to the style that Minecraft is. So like you have to it's more it's hard than, to jump. Yeah. yeah, you have to learn how the style works to make it look really good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean our stories kind of interweave and overlap. So yeah, I mean before Animation Mentor, I was like kind of lost. <laughs> like I, I didn't go to, I went to like a year of general college classes, but basically just to waste time. <laughs> it wasn't like, I didn't know what I was doing and I knew I wanted to do art. I knew I wanted to, to do art all of high school. I've been drawing my whole life and that's really the only thing I'm good at and the only thing that actually drives me so yeah I went and I knew I wanted to do something art related I didn't know what um and then a few years after like a year after high school I kind of realized that uh animation not actual animation but like the animation industry would be great for me like doing concept or storyboarding so I was just kind of dipping my toes in that and trying to figure out how to get good at that but I'm from Wisconsin and everything that I knew about animation was in California. And I was like, I had no connection and I didn't see how I could ever, like, un like I couldn't figure out how I could actually do a job that was in the film industry. So I kind of just tinkered around with that, tried to figure that out. And that's when I came across Animation Mentor somehow. I don't know how, just being in the animation world and I thought that was really interesting. And like, I started learning more about it and I was honestly feeling kind of unfulfilled on um, drawing. Like it wasn't quite, 
I love it and I still do it all the time, obviously, but it just doesn't quite fulfill me. And when I found out animation is like about storytelling, acting, um, you have to know like sign, like <laughs> obviously not a ton, but like some sciencey things on like how the human body works and just things like that. And um, researching, researching characters and uh, movement, all of that combined is like everything that I like about art and different aspects of art. And it was like this amazing art form combined. So I was really intrigued by that and wanted to start learning. And I signed up for the Maya workshop, which if you don't know, is just like <laughs> taking a sphere and like moving it across the screen. Mm -hmm. Basically that's it. And I was like in love with doing it. Like I thought it was the coolest thing ever, even though it's so simple, just strange looking back. But yeah, it really, it really just showed that how much I could love animation and yeah, the rest is history. I signed up for all six classes and, uh, af and obviously with Robert <laughs> and a other group of people. And obviously we met all these guys too. And then after that, I took, I took, um, Nara Yoon. <laughs> we both got into Nara Yoon's class. It was just a little class of four, but I think his class was probably the most influence like because we got so much one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. and it was live critiques it probably helped both of us more than all of am combined <laughs> yeah. am was great mm -hmm. and gave you an amazing foundation but being able to have like this master class after am was huge for us and really made a lot of clicks happen and um, so yeah, then really, I think midway through or at the end of NARS class, I got into Blue Sky for the Blue Sky um, trainee program. And then that was the same time that the pandemic happened. It was the spring of what 2020. And uh, so yeah, <laughs> the world blew up and I was planning on moving to Blue Sky and then everything became virtual for it got kind of canceled and then they thought of this program that we would do virtually so it became like the blue sky mentorship so it was basically like an am class or a nara yoon's class where we had a mentor and we worked on animation with them um i had eric anderson who actually after blue sky sadly <laughs> shut down he came to work with us at disney for a while now he's at pixar so that just shows how awesome he is. But um, yeah, so that was a great experience and helped my reel a ton. And then right after, uh, soon after that, uh, Robert got his job at the Minecraft uh, studio that we were talking about. And we actually were going to move to St. Louis together um, <laughs> for that job, but it didn't work out. And we were kind of down about that and just like didn't know what we were going to do um but like a week later maybe not even disney was like hello <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's up so i got an interview with disney had a couple of uh, little interviews with them and they offered me the job and they were like okay pack up move to california so yeah that's where we are now and it's amazing. I love Disney so much. Like it really is a dream job. It's everything I imagined and more, even though we're not even in the studio, it's like a five minute drive away <laughs> and we can just look at it for now. Um, but I'm sure when we're being it, like in the studio, it's going to be even better, but just the people and the work and the community is just everything that I imagined and Robert has gotten a lot of opportunities being out here, like you said, and yeah, that's basically, basically our stories. And it's like it's, somewhere in there, we <laughs> became friends <laughs> and moved in together and yeah, whatever. Somewhere in there. So something happened in between, you know? Yeah, that happened. Somewhere, somewhere in there. I made the thousand mile drive to Wisconsin. Yeah. Anything bonds you as a couple. I'm sure it was that, you know? <laughs> yeah.
But no, I think it's a perfect example of if something doesn't, <clears throat> if something doesn't work out, it's probably because there's something better on the way. And it's just, it's a perfect example of don't get blinded by one opportunity or don't get hung up too much over one opportunity because it's probably not meant to be if it's going to be that difficult or if it's going to blow up in your face. I did forget a part where I also got hired at Blue Sky. Oh, that that's a good, that's a good example because I had the Blue Sky in the mentorship, I guess it was called. And then um, soon after I got Oh, I, I got the story wrong. Okay, he got, we had, we had, the, tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I have it now. We had, we were going to St. Louis, that got canceled, basically. Then we were, like, sad about that. Blue Sky called. Blue Sky yeah. was like. Like the next day. <laughs> yeah, like the next day, it was like, hey, we we have a job, do you want to work? And it, it would have been, it would have been virtually at that point. Um. So, yeah, we were excited about that we would have, we would get to uh, just work from Blue Sky virtually. Um, and I was totally into doing that. And then Disney called for an interview. So I had Disney, a Disney job, and a Blue Sky job. Like I had to decide. And it was like this big decision because Blue Sky was hiring me as an animator, while Disney at the time was hiring me as a crowds fix animator. So it would be like, like, Disney is my dream job. Like, that's what I really want. Or Blue Sky, which obviously would be amazing. And I, it also a dream job. But, like, I would get to actually be an animator. So it was a big decision. And I just, I decided to do Disney. I'm like, Disney is going to get me out of my comfort zone. We have to move for that. Um, it's my working on projects that I really love. And we just took that leap. Mm-hmm. And as you know about couple weeks later blue sky closed so i would have i would have uh been out of a job right away so yeah. in hindsight that that decision was really scary because it's like this yeah. it was already scary oh. but yeah so yeah that's so crazy that they were offering you a job it's like did no one know the yeah. right. they were going to close no did, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot and of people sad. got got hired and then like a, a yeah. few later they just like yeah i know a few it was their first week the week that they closed down you know like yeah. they, they literally just started we're going through onboarding and then it closed <laughs> like that weekend so and what's great about even better that i kind of dodged that is disney ended up being more like a full animator position rather than just crowds i became i'm actually an assisting animator which we do get to do shot work and um yeah so it was definitely the right decision and it's just yeah it's terrifying <laughs> looking back being like if i would have done this it, yeah but it's just a good example of just trust your intuition and if something bad <laughs> seemingly comes up or you don't get a job or a job gets canceled like there'll be another one and it'll probably be better or at least more fitted yeah. for you. Mm-hmm. So. I yeah. think that's a really important thing with like students, especially they think like, oh, this one thing didn't work out. I'm duped, you know, like, cause you put all your focus because that's kind of like an animator trait, right? It's like getting hyper-focused and like, I'm going to do this thing. You've played it out to the end already in your head of like, oh, I'm going to get this job or have this opportunity. And when that doesn't work out, it's important to view the big picture, right? Kind of like with your story, like there was lots of different opportunities and things that either didn't work out or you chose another way. And it's important to for students, I think, to keep that in mind, which is hard. Yeah. Easier said than done, right? Yeah, yeah. and sometimes it's not the right time either. Like, if you mm-hmm. Pixar didn't, Pixar didn't uh, take you this this time, maybe you just weren't ready. So, and next yeah. year or the year after. And I had a I had a very similar thing happen as well. Right at the end of the tail end of AM, where I was doing I was doing class six, I was doing Nara's mentorship, and then Brazen offered me a job. Mm-hmm. But they wanted me to move within like three days. They're like, okay, we want you to move in studio. And I would have had to move to Dallas, which is like six hours away or five five hours away. And they're like, yeah, we want you to start on Monday. And it was like already Friday. (laughs) So I'm like, well, I have two assignments due on Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) It's Um, that's also just weird for life because I don't know if we would be in the same spot we would be yeah because you would have moved there and might not have had the opportunity to move to wisconsin 
where I live. And yeah. So. Yeah. And they weren't paying enough uh, for it to be like an easy, just like, okay, let me get a three month uh, apartment uh, because it was just a trainee program for like three months. And, but they still wanted me to like move really quickly and they weren't going to help. Um, and, and then like, uh, I, I eventually said no, um, but just because it wouldn't have been possible. I would have failed. Like I would have not been able to finish AM. I wouldn't have been able to finish my mentorship with NARA. Uh, so I wouldn't have been able to afford to live. Uh, and then, um, and then like three weeks later, the, the pandemic hit. So like then I would have been trapped in Dallas. Like I wouldn't have had any, anything to do. Like it would have, everything would have fell through. I would have been trapped in a lease and I, I wouldn't know what to do. So it was just another, another case of don't blindly say yes to a company just because they're offering you a job. Like you really got to think about it and, and understand that if you've gotten an offer from a studio, that means you're going to get an offer from another studio. Like they're not the only ones. That that job is not the only thing that good thing that's ever going to happen to you. So yeah, it's a it's good to weigh your options. Obviously, getting your foot into the door is hard, and sometimes you have to just take that first job. But yeah, you have to think about it. Make sure it makes sense, and really evaluate. Like, could I get another opportunity if I if the studio wants me as my real? If, like was it just a stroke of luck or can I actually have a reel that stands up mm -hmm. yeah. to yeah. and allows you to get into other studios? Though I later found out that I would have been able to work on Crash Bandicoot. So I would have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I but guess on that. Especially in this industry, you have to be very light on your feet and easy, able to pivot when stuff doesn't work out. Cause like right. I had a job that I was waiting on for three months where I'd already signed a contract I was promised a certain pay and I was literally waiting to start because they kept delaying me and delaying me and delaying me and come times to where I finally get to start the job and they're like, oh, we can't afford you. Sorry. Well, we may reach out to you in a couple months. And I was like counting on that job. I was waiting for that job to start and luck had it that a friend of mine offered me a job two days before that that I had turned down because I was just about to start this new job and I was able to contact him and that's why I'm at day for night right now and I'm working previs and it's honestly a lot of fun learning cameras but that just came out of nowhere within two days I went from having this job to a different job and it just pivoted immediately yeah. and so you have the to same be kind able of to Oh, just gonna, you have to be able to drop and pivot very quickly in this industry because studios will pick you up and drop you seemingly overnight. And if you're like yeah. all in on everything all the time, it'll be very hard when things just pull the rug from out from under you. <laughs> yeah. And you always need to keep your options open because what happened to me was I had finished Spirit and we were going to be in the same studio working on another project. And I was super excited. I even was going to be character lead. So I was like, yes, this is a great opportunity. And before this, I was talking with a few other studios that had contacted me and they were like, hey, do you want to come work with us? I'm like, no, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm good, thank you. <laughs> and suddenly this project gets um, canceled because another studio was going to be doing it. And we were all, in for love so suddenly we don't really have any work to do we don't know if we're gonna get anything else to do and me being on a visa here in the uk i can't just be like oh we'll see because if suddenly they don't want me anymore i have to go back to my country and so i messaged the previous studio that i was uh messaging with a few months ago i'm like hey so a project uh, the project i was working on actually finished right now so if you have any openings and that's where I'm working right now. So always keep your options open and always um, talk with other studios because like you say, you don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe one, from one day to the other, you don't have a job. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. scary, but also it's scary, but also not as scary as it seems. Like I feel like when we talk about it, it's way more scary. And I, I don't like when students get afraid of that and just like cons I because I worried about that kind of thing as a student but it's really not that bad you just have to have like you said just keep your options open um, make sure that you 
are communicating with people in the industry, like, you know, having your friends, asking your friends, not being afraid to just kind of put yourself out there and you'll be okay. Like, it's not, it's not too bad. It, it's kind of, it's more, un, uh, what's the word, not as stable as most jobs are, I guess, but it's also, there's a lot of opportunity out there, I think, once you yeah, get in. Was, yeah, that was actually a question that we got from someone. They asked, um, how do you deal with the mental stress of working contract to contract? Just kind of like what we're talking about now, like dealing with that uncertainty and having to I think stay sane. <laughs> what would you say? For me, I kind of have like an opposite problem right now where I'm like, my contract is like it. I have too much job security. I'm like, I want to go other places and I'm afraid <laughs> to, to cut that off to yeah. do something else. So, you know, I mean, I think, I think it, it's the kind of industry where, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, but also you have the liberty to just send your reel out wherever you want and keep your options open. So yeah. it's like, it's, it's not the most secure job, but it's also a very unique job where, you can kind of go and do whatever you want as long as your your skills allow it. Yeah. A yeah. good thing to do is know when your contract is up. Um, be constantly working on your reel in your spare time. Don't just let it die unless you're doing a lot of great work at your studio that you can put on your reel. But a lot of times you can't do that for a long time and if it's not out yet. But um, yeah, make sure you're updating your reel and still feel good about your reel and feel like it's at least at your current level of skill and and just apply <laughs> apply for jobs right around the time that you your contract's going to be up. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the best you can do. Oh, I was gonna say, that's a common misconception I hear from a lot of students is they think, oh, I'm gonna get a job and that job's immediately gonna get me jobs other places. But a lot of the time, the stuff you do at a studio is not going to be real worthy. And mm -hmm. it takes working on shots after hours, part time, whatever, to keep updating your reel to continually try to get that next job. Because, yeah. I mean, I've been working almost two and a half years straight. And it's kind of what like Robert was saying is like, I've actually been trying to take a break from working so I can work on my reel full time. And every time a job gets over, I'm like, okay, here we go. Free time. Let's go. And then two days later, three days later, they're like, yo, I got a job for you. And it's like, I can't turn down a job. So I've been working almost two and a half years straight. And it's because I'm constantly putting myself out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said this before. I've never gotten a job or I've gotten one job that I actually applied to. Every other job I've gotten has come from a friend <laughs> or yeah. a connection of somebody being like, hey, this guy, I know this guy, we should hire him here. And that's one of the best ways of getting jobs is networking and having friends and putting yourself out there, making connections. I have connections in basically every studio out there and not just with other animators, with modelers, surfacing artists, riggers, all these other different art realms. And it, it, it helps, not that I'm doing it to get a job. I'm not being like, hey, yo, you want to give me a job sometime in the future? It's like, I'm genuinely making friends and giving help and putting myself out there because I like doing that. But it does have the end effect of sometimes helping you get jobs. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I forgot to mention during my little story <laughs> spiel, but I, in class two, my mentor was working on a short film and um, he had worked at Pixar and he was doing his own short film and he, for some reason, liked me and let me work on his short film, even though I had, I was in class two, which was basically just walk cycles, right, at that point. Yeah. So it was pretty crazy. Um, so having that opportunity early on to work on a production and get like really nice rigs to work with and have people, and I got to do a dog, dog animation. So having that on my reel early on showed people that I could work on production and on a team and everything so that I think that really really helped me especially get the blue sky the blue sky um, mentorship for them to see that I had like it was they could tell it was like not super professional work like it wasn't like a movie or anything but they could see that I was on a team that I had multiple shots with using the same characters and it was just nice to kind of see 
that I had a little bit of experience. So I, because going from a student to working through a pipeline is a big difference. Like when you're just working on your own stuff, your own shots, you don't have to rely on anyone else. You don't have to think about teams, the teams down the line. You don't have to work with other people really at all. So them knowing that you know how to work at a studio or on a team is really, I think, a benefit for for when you're getting hired. So having a little bit of professional work or even just tricking them into thinking that it's professional work, like doing doing a character <laughs> with like multiple uh using the same character for multiple shots, like with the same personality and the same like character characteristics is a good idea, I think. Um, and you're, yeah. allowed, you're allowed to say what the project was, right? Yeah, it's, it's run, Toti run by, uh, directed by Shad Bradbury. Yep. It's still not out, it's been <laughs> so long, but it should it's be. so good, good then. Yeah, it's really, it's going to be worth it, but hopefully, I think he said by the end of this year or at the beginning of next year, it should be out, so. Yeah, yeah. I think we've all been following it pretty closely and it's going to be really cool. It's just like kind of sad because all my work on it, I was obviously in class two, which was two and a half, three years ago or something now. And yeah, my work, sharing my work is going to be a little... A little sad because I'm like, oh no, it's so old, but it'll still be cool. And it's still on my reel, honestly. The shots are on my reel when I got into Disney and Blue Sky, so I guess they're they hold up a little bit at least. Yeah. Got you this far. <laughs> and another thing about a benefit of being on a production is it shows that you can maintain consistency that's not your style. Because a lot of animators, you watch all their shots and they all are like, oh, this is this person's style and it's very specific to them. Mm -hmm. For studios to see, oh, this is a set style set by someone else and you can match that and make it feel, you know, smooth through all these different shots is really, really important for people to see. It's like mm -hmm. this person can fit their style to someone else's. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a big difference uh, like between student and professional work that I found is that in, when you're a student, you get to pick whatever you animate. And a lot of times you pick the things that you can handle, that you think you can handle. Right. Um, and and you, you kind of stick to that. But when you're a professional, you have to be able to animate someone else's vision and you have to be able to animate whatever they tell you. So it's like you're doing you're you're being told to animate something you probably never animated before but you have to figure it out or know how it works. And I think um, it just requires another level of understanding of movement and, and acting and, and all the, the fundamentals. But yeah, that was the biggest, that was probably the biggest thing I noticed from moving from student to professional work is just that, that you don't get to choose anymore. You don't get to limit yourself. Right. Yep. That was kind of goes into a question that we had too. Someone asked, what are some tips for people trying to break into feature animation who have little to non-professional experience or like still a student or starting out? Well, um, for me, I pretty much got into Blue Sky and Disney without any professional work. I Like I said, I had the short film, but like that was very much not super professional. It, it was just like a group of animators working on a project really. So I it wasn't a studio or anything. Um, so it's really just like you just have to have great work great work and a lot of times you have to start out if you don't have professional work a lot of times you have to start out at like lower level jobs like a trainee an intern a um uh, anything like like that a junior position even because a lot of times it does take a big studio to get in i know that for the uh, Disney and Blue Sky like trainee programs, you don't need professional experience. You can just get in. But I know that the animators that they hire at Disney, like 99% of them have DreamWorks, Sony, Pixar, like they have that before they get in. So it's good to be able to aim for positions that are like trainee intern. And I got kind of lucky because the pandemic didn't allow Disney to do trainee a trainee program last year so they didn't have trainees to to 
go into the position that I am. Usually they train the trainees, the tell dev to over a year to then jump on to being a crowd artist, uh, but they didn't have that. So they're kind of looking for like this in-between level. So that's kind of, that's how I got in and became an assisting animator. They needed someone who didn't need to be trained for a year necessarily, but also uh, didn't have any experience really before that, but could still handle kind of a production. So it was like this weird medium, but I guess it's just, the answer is you just have to have <laughs> really good work and uh, aim for the, the entry level position. So be applying for animator at Pixar or like senior animator at Blizzard. It's just, you have to <laughs> start slowly and mm -hmm. get, aim for jobs that you are capable of doing. Yeah. And could you repeat the question? Cause I totally <laughs> went over my head, but um, cause I wanted to address that. I just forgot. Uh, I think, let's see. I we could link it as we do them, but um, what are some oh, what are some tips for people trying to break into feature animation who have little to no professional experience? Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So my my advice would just be to climb the ladder. Um, the the first the first professional job that I got was uh, like I said the was Minecraft animation with Enchanted Mob and uh, Cubicle Studios. And the reason I I had applied for that is because I was you know I was scrolling the the lists of uh, of jobs on on the job boards and and uh examination and enchanted mob popped up and i was like hey i know them i can do that i used to be a minecraft animator <laughs> yeah i can totally do that so um it, it felt like the first logical step of a prof of like getting my foot in the door for a professional uh for professional work because it was it was something i i knew i could do it was something that um, I knew all about, and I just I I put in my reel and then uh, reached out to them, uh, reached out to them personally, so that my reel wouldn't get buried in in all the other applicants, and um, and it worked. And then from there, I was able to uh, get all the, the repetition that I needed because they're very high frequency. Uh, they animate a lot of shots, um, and you get the good thing about that is you get so much repetition on on your mechanics. And then uh, eventually um, they let, I, I had to do one project where they where they let me do all the cameras and that got, and then um, when the third floor uh, possibility came up, uh, they asked, can you do cameras? I was like, I just did a whole a whole music video about, pretty much by myself of doing all the layout. I was like, sure, I can do that. And uh, and then that got me to the next step. And then the, uh, because I, I find, now I'm in feature. Now I'm I'm working on on these big movies uh, at at the third floor. Who uh, the third floor networks out to all the other v, uh, VFX studios because they work on so much previs for for so many movies because they're so uh, ingrained in the industry that um, I guess the the next step in in getting to a full VFX animator was um, that 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 was the right next step. So then I I applied to. Uh, the next uh, logical step in that, and that got me to uh, to Luma, and now um, with that, I'm I'm seeing where where the next step is for me uh, right now. But but yeah, that'd be my best advice is just to take what you've learned from school and and find the studio that is the first step for you. You know, in, in Taylor's case, she uh, she worked so hard in school, and she and she came into it with amazing. Uh, talent for for appeal and and from a drawing background that her first step her first right step was blue sky you know and that that happens for some people and you know it, it just that for her it took a lot of hard work uh just throughout her whole life of in in her art background but that was the first right step for her. and then from from that blue sky internship i guess toti was your first your first kind of step and then that got you to blue sky and then uh blue sky mentorship got her to to disney but I think it's it's about personally finding your first step. Yeah, you have to know your real. You have to you have to understand what like realistically what you can do. Like I knew that if I I had the opportunity where I didn't have very many bills, I didn't I didn't have really any responsibility, so I could just like t take my time to really get my real up to the the level because I knew I was close. 
and get my reel up to the level to apply to all my all the bigger cities and all like kind of my dream jobs but that's not you have that's not always the case if depending on where you are you might need a job right away and your skill level might not be that high or you honestly your your feature like having feature level animation might be far far off for you a couple of years or something so it's good to really think about where you are and and start applying for yeah the jobs that are, are right for you and then go from there. I think that's great advice because I think a lot of students, especially straight out of school, they think Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks, that's it, right? And they don't think about like the smaller jobs that you gain that experience because also it can be scary to join a bigger studio straight out of school because you don't have that experience of pipeline and stuff you're talking about with stuff you learned on Toady, right? It's things like that that you're learning early on or like Robert, where you learned like doing Minecraft animation, learning how to develop a style, learning how to like keep consistency and reach a quality bar. I think that's important for students to hear, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and either, either way, it takes, it takes work, right? Because like even you, right. Taylor, you got out of school and you took a mentorship with Nara and that took a lot <laughs> of work. You were working on Toady at the same time, but you yeah. improved a lot through that class and that's how you got into feature. And Ro yeah. took kind of the other approach which is start at one studio work really hard get better and just continually work up the studio ladder until you get to where you want to be which is kind of the two options you have to kind of get into feature yeah i was working i was doing class six at a.m i was doing the short i was trying to wrap up the short film for toti i was doing nara's class and then i shortly after or like right at the end i started the blue sky mentorship so i had like so many things going on it was it wasn't helpful though like it was too much i couldn't keep up with it and it's not like i was necessarily at that point trying to do all that do all of that because i would be crazy like that before and do am and toti and stuff but at that point it was like burnout kind of um but it the burnout kind of came at a good time where where i I was kind of at a burnout right when I started getting hired hired at Blue Sky. So it was kind of a weird time to be burned out. It was like I have my reel that can get me in, but now I don't feel like animating because I just did like tons of stuff. But yeah, that passed once Disney hired me because I got super hyped up again. But right. it was it was kind of like a little lull just from being overworked. That was a crazy that's a that's just don't do too much where you can't get anything done is a good tip yeah. like coming out of that but that also kind of, oh go ahead yourself, sorry but give yourself enough as well i feel like people slack too much honestly and yeah yeah that's something that we talk a lot that we've talked several times on streams of like balance of work <laughs> of sometimes there are times that yes get your eight hours of sleep when you can but when you crunch and you can only get three hours of sleep do that or if you have to go all night or do that because yeah. i think there's kind of this like weird shift in like thinking right now in terms of like animation school of like oh well self-care is important and yes it is like those times are important to take care of yourself make sure that you're not burnt out all the time but also teach yourself how to work, right? Like teach yourself how to work hard and not slack and get, if, if you have goals, right? Because if you have goals of like, I do want to be a teacher, I want to be the, you know, the studio or that studio, you have to get your stuff there, right? So it just depends on how hard you have to work to get there is important. Yeah, everyone has a different breaking point too. And exactly. I, I don't, I can handle a lot of that kind of stuff. So sometimes when people are like, they're telling me <laughs> that I'm doing too much. I'm like, I know myself, I'm fine. This is Great. what I would feel worse if I wasn't, if I wasn't um, doing so much work to get where I want to be. I would rather be a little stressed out than still stuck somewhere in life that I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And I just, yeah, it's good for people to also hear that it's okay to work a ton. Like yeah. you're not going to you're, you're, it's good. You can do that, especially when you're young and don't have responsibilities. Like it's okay to do a month of like all nighters, as long as you're not dying. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't, yeah. in class, uh, sit five or six, I used to, uh, 
So there were there were times where where I would work uh, all night and into the morning, and it would be like 10 a.m. right, and I would I would turn in for the week. Uh, <laughs> I'd turn in. For the week. I had hadn't slept in in forever. Then I'd I'd drive to go get donuts, eat a whole half thing a dozen <laughs> a half a dozen of donuts, and then fall asleep for the rest of the day for for Sunday. <laughs> and then, I love the treat yourself. In the middle of the week. Teach yourself through the pain. I did the work. I'm going to get done. I'm going to sleep all day. I I remember doing that was when we had like a hangout and we stayed up. I think we got up at two in the morning, three in the morning and started animating and it got to be like 8 a.m. And I was like, all right, guys. We're all going to get donuts. And like we all went and got donuts and we just like ate them on on Discord. Mm -hmm. And it was honestly a lot of fun. But yeah. Treating yeah, yourself to donuts is good. <laughs> treat, treat yourself to donuts after an all-nighter. Yes. But also don't drive when you're super, super tired. <laughs> you That's true. Good point. Yeah, yeah, if you can walk there, you get the exercise. That's or just always have donuts yeah. stocked up. So if you need yeah. to, they're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a time where I where I had a full-time, I had a full-time job and I was doing uh, AM. And I was only getting like two hours to sometimes even like 20 minutes of sleep before <laughs> a, a night. And that was no, just no. ridiculous. But yeah, like, don't do that. that was just dangerous. Like, I don't even know how I made it to work every day. Um, but I would, I would, there was like one day, it was like my dedicated Thursday where I would come home uh, and I would sleep for 16 hours. Like I would come home from work, fall asleep, and I would wake up the next day and go to work. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But it was, you know, it's just sometimes you got to do that for, for animation. I mean, Maybe not that ridiculous, but you know, sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit uh, just to, to get where you want. Especially for someone like yeah. me, who, who I was, I don't see myself as the most talented person. I'm, I've always had to work really hard to get somewhere that I want. That maybe uh, someone with talent wouldn't have to work as hard. But you know, some people just some people have to work really hard to get where they want, and that's just just how it is. Okay. It's yeah, it it AM for us and was kind of like our college years and I yeah. think a lot of people do that kind of thing in college where they where they'd stay up studying or whatever. And we it, it was the same for us. We would stay up on Zoom calls with our, our friends working and and yeah, it a lot of times there were all nighters, but it was fun because we were all doing it together and it wasn't like most of the most of the time it wasn't us like alone mm-hmm. at 3 a.m. like crying. <laughs> it was, it was fun. We, were, we were had our friend group and we would do things like you know Dan said he, like him and his friends got donuts. We would have dance parties <laughs> in the middle of it and stuff. Oh and, yeah, like would, YouTube yeah. breaks or we'd watch a movie together while we're doing it. So yeah, we we were, we had this thing with our friends that we we called it study hall. And um, I'd make a Zoom for, for us uh, every night. And we just hop into the, the AM uh, campus, like the, for our class, that, that, uh, that link that they give you, uh, since it never expires. And we'd, we'd all just hang out in there and animate together um, all night sometimes. If, uh, and that, that was a great help because some, you can just, you know, you can share your screen, you can work together you can learn from each other and get critiques, live critiques right from uh, from each other. And also it keeps the, um, it keeps you working, you know, it keeps you wanting to work. It keeps you alive. So, you, you know, you, it keeps you accountable. That's um, the number one thing that I, I recommend when you're learning animation is just make a lot of friends. And this can be hard, especially that you're depending on your personality, depending on your where you are in your life and your schedule and everything but if you do join something like animation mentor really put yourself out there and i'm a, i'm was it i'm better now but i was a very shy person like i'm pretty keep to myself kind of person i have like my good friends so going into am i was just really excited to be around people for the first time who were creative and kind of like the same type of people as me. So it just like kind of brought it out in me, I think. And I feel like that's what it should be doing for you. And yeah, just like let let yourself enjoy 
being around people who are like-minded and have similar goals and yeah, passions. There's someone yeah. that um, said in the asked a question in the chat too. It's like, what is the best way to network besides like animation mentor? Like, how do you go about networking with people or just tips? It's hard when you're not in a school setting. I think just trying, if you can, join any type of mentorship you can. Like, um, I don't know how to say it right, but Kyosho is that how you say it? Kyosho. Officially, it has Kyosho, like yep. ways of saying it, but joining that. Um, Robert and I have a mentorship where we're building a really great community on uh, the di discords, like the channel box, like becoming mm -hmm. friends in that. And yeah, just like putting, it's hard to like set out to make friends. Like I didn't really set out to make friends at AM. It's just, we were all excited and, and it just kind of happened. Um, so yeah, it's hard. It's just, you can't really explain how to make friends. You just have to put yourself into communities and and let it happen, talk, yeah. be a just, part of the community. And just immerse yourself in, into communities wherever you can. And then, you know, people are you're gonna you're gonna find people who you really click with and that, that's gonna become your friend group. Um, luckily for for us, we had this this class of people that we started with in class one that just wanted to stay together. And even though that thinned down to um, eventually, I think only you and I were in the same class six from our original class one that went through every single class, but um, together, but like people, uh, we, we had this, this group that just wanted to stay together and, and uh, we're all still friends and we all still, still network and, and talk to each other. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just uh, immersing yourself. In the in the world of animation, and you're gonna make friends as long as you have an open mind and and you're nice and. What you don't want to do is just message people randomly, like yeah, one off was, people. That you, well, it's not bad. It's like you're not gonna make friends that way. Like talk, like messaging, like a Disney animator or messaging another animator, being like, "Hi, what's up? Cool stuff." It's not going to most likely result in friendship, and I think that's how people go about it when they don't when they're not a part of a group. So join a group, immerse yourself like Robert was saying, and you'll you'll fit you'll find it. Yeah. Naturally. <laughs> and I think yeah, especially we could all... if you sorry, go. Oh I was just gonna say I think we could all say that we wouldn't be halfway where we are now without those groups of people. Like no. yeah, I wouldn't yeah. I probably wouldn't have made it past class uh, three or four without <laughs> without the help of of everyone that was in our in our class. Yeah, yeah I had I had a few people in my class one group who had already been, you know, had been animators already. I was Brent, like I barely touched Maya, but there were other people who went to college for animation or just had been doing it that like pushed me, pushed my eye right away. Like you could see that I was good and like I had a knack for it, but like obviously I was super new and they would just like help, help with little things here and there that like made me have really good clicks early on that I would have been struggling for a lot longer if I was just kept to myself and didn't have a friend group around me uh, yeah. helping. I think another yeah. people thing, another thing that people don't realize too is like with your friends, like they help you a lot, but giving your friends feedback and like helping your friends makes you grow as an animator a ton. Like I just know like my experience, like being able to, you know, you get so much help from them, but also learning how to give notes and like how to look at someone else's animation, help them. It's huge. And it really helps you grow to be able to see your own work differently. And it's, just yeah. a lot of it's not, miss. it's not specific to any certain friend group. Like, yes, yeah. different friend groups have different pros and cons and the, t the people you have in those groups. But like, you know, me and Madison were kind of in a certain friend group and you and Robert were in a different one and we didn't really get to know each other till after AM. Yeah, and like me and Cynthia were in a certain friend group, but she was also in one that was before me because she was way before me. So like she had a friend group and then I kind of got grafted into that friend group after later. Where it, and then me and Madison got into a friend group and now like you guys are in our friend group kind of like there's so many different friend groups and they all have different pros and cons. But it, it's so the same with. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's the same with any friend group. And a lot of what I would see of like you talking about like just like shooting people messages i see like people look at a friend group that's already there and they're like oh this friend group hey i have to be in that one in order to succeed 
but you really just have to find people that are around you and be friendly and create one or like join one or like you know you don't have to see one friend group and be like i have to be in there and that's how i'm going yeah. to get into the cool yeah, kids cause... club because everyone's different and everybody has different schedules that bring people together and mm. you know i yeah, kind of lost yeah. my train of thought but <laughs> anything it won't work yeah yeah and the animation industry is so small that the people who you make friends with doesn't don't they don't need to be disney animators because the person that's starting right out right now might end up in disney later you don't have to become friends with someone for the benefits yeah. you just have to make friends a lot of my friends who i knew at am are now a at great places, but we all started from the same place. Well, and it, what? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say what you were basically saying, but the point you look for people who are passionate and and hardworking. That's what you want to look for in a friend group, not who's the best. Not. Yeah. I mean, those those are the people that I think we all gravitated toward, including each other, and that's the that's the people who are going to help motivate you. They're going to help you in the future um, with jobs. You're gonna you're gonna just grow off of each other, and it'll be a like a friendship that is that you can yeah like you can grow together rather than someone is dragging you down or someone is <laughs> or whatever vice versa. Not that I'm, I'm making it sound like friendships are only to like help eat, help yourself, but that's not what I mean. It's yeah. just. You want to surround yourself with passionate, passionate, hardworking people, and no matter where they are, skill level. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I found too is like I have like different people that I know I can go to different things about. Like, oh, I need really need help with my like my mechanics are feeling awful. The body mechanics. I know one person go to for notes for that. Or I'm like my facial poses look terrible. Taylor, <laughs> I'm like a help. So like you have different people that you know you can go to for different things too which is cool like don't limit yourself to like oh this person's good and an amazing animator they can only, they they'll help me like no like limit don't limit yourself to like just certain people because of what you see because you'll know if you get to know other people just by being a friendly person being nice you'll find that they have really valuable things everyone has valuable stuff that you can share and that's the cool part about like study groups or having people together is people will make you think about things you wouldn't on your own or notice things that you wouldn't on your own. Watching so each other work is really, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. And also, like mm -hmm. you were saying before, Madison, like critiquing people's work mm -hmm. is also really helpful. Like maybe you have a couple of friends who aren't at the level you are quite at, like they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Critique their work as if it were your own and have them like be able to see what you would think about and what you would do and just help them like get to your level as well and then maybe they'll get better than you and then it's <laughs> kind of like a, a like a growing thing just help each other out and the I think sometimes people don't want to help others or they they want to keep other people down so that they can go up and that was kind of a weird mentality I didn't like have that mentality but I kind of thought about the world that way a little bit going into AM, but at the beginning of AM, I'm like, I realized that helping other people um, would just help everyone because they're going to, if you, if you have a friend who gets into a big studio, like you have this, now you have someone who works at this big studio or, or it can help you get a job down the line. So yeah. just yeah. everyone sharing. Yeah. No. And you don't even have to connect over like animation specifically. Like one of my better friends now, like we connected playing League of Legends after animation. <laughs> so like we'd animate and then we'd play League of Legends and you know, he, he just got hired at Disney and like we went from playing League of Legends together to animating together and giving feedback to each other and helping each other a lot. And the, one of my other friends, we connected over playing Fortnite together. <laughs> and so, like, you don't even have to connect over animation in particular, but it is, you know, things that are specific about you that you can connect to other people can bring you into connecting with them through animation and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, like, I've connected to so many people so many different ways, and, you know, games, movies, watching movies together, like you guys said, like, 
watching Disney movies. There's so many different ways you can connect to people that isn't just animation specific, but can have outcomes that have you helping animation ways. Yeah, just to get to know people and, and yeah, we would watch movies all the time, not even just animation movies. We'd watch just good films. We'd, mm -hmm. I'm sure we played games and we just, we just <laughs> had fun and we found other people who are similar and then yeah, animation was at the core of everything, but yeah, yeah. just just friends. And just art as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Just art in general. Just, yeah, art and storytelling. You know, you just take, you find the things that you're passionate about and you find other like-minded people and great things are going to happen is with when passion and, uh, and when the, the passion is there and the, the interest is there and, you know, you just, find people that are like my like minded and uh, make friends and you know that's those things are going to grow into great things. And just a quick uh, interruption. Thank you everybody who's following. I've been seeing the notifications coming up, but uh, didn't want to interrupt interrupt the good conversation, but thank you all who uh, followed and subscribed and all that. So yes, thank you. <clears throat> I kind of have like a question someone asked. It's kind of like circles back to when you were first talking like specifically like Taylor, you too, about talking about not knowing about animation mentor, but just knowing you loved art. Someone asked like, what would you say to people who want to pursue animation, but still don't really like know yet what they want or like what part of the career they want? Like, what would you say to that? I personally say, try it all. Um, when I first started as an animator, but way before AM, I started animating Minecraft because I wanted to tell uh, stories deeper than what I could or than what I was already doing, which was machinima with Minecraft, which is, you know, just character, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, so I, I wanted that, that storytelling. So in order to do so, I had to, I, I pretty much did everything except for making the rigs. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything except for making the rigs I had to do myself. Um, I had to, to light, um, and render and animate and write the story, do a lot of the voice lines. And because of that, I've, I got a nice introduction into every department, um, at least a lot of the departments. And I figure it helped me figure out what I wanted to do and what I, what I liked the most. And I found that I liked uh, the performance and the thrill that I got from animating, uh, even if it was just, uh, just something simple. Like I, when I first started, uh, with anim when I first started animating, I, I started to look at life differently. I started to look at movement as uh, way differently. I started to appreciate every movement. Uh, and it, it was just this weird way of seeing the world differently. And because of that, I knew that that I wanted to to pursue animation. And you know I, I got to I got to do lighting and that helped me see that made me see, things differently. Like I would, I would look at trees and I would see the lighting on them and I would just really appreciate uh, every, everything about, about what I was seeing, but nothing quite uh, captured me like, like animation did. Animation felt like it, it captured all the art forms uh, inside, inside of itself. And that, that pushed me to want to do it uh, professionally and then eventually go to, to animation mentor. So I think, I think if you, try everything just a little bit um you'll find really quickly what really inspires you about the art form yeah i kind of have a maybe a little bit of a hot take about this but <laughs> as it as being an like an artist my whole life like doing all like i did everything like i've done i've drawn i've done paintings i've done cartooning and comics i've done all not really professionally maybe i made some money but like nothing official um graphic design logos uh what whatever just trying everything and a, a lot of it didn't feel right until i found anim animating and if animating doesn't feel right maybe it's just not right like i i think sometimes you might want to push yourself to do something like i wanted i had different art things that I really, really wanted to do and really wanted to make happen, but it just wasn't happening. And animation started happening. Like I, I found people, I found 
connections, I was like good at it. Like I was exceeding and it just felt right. And other art forms didn't feel right before and in the animation industry and just totally unrelated. Like I wanted to do um, concept art, but it just wasn't going anywhere. Like I wasn't, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have that. I didn't have the connections. I didn't have the big passion as other people did. So yeah, it's just knowing, really thinking inside yourself, like, am I actually passionate enough about this? Is this actually right for me? Because some people just have a fantasy of like, I want to be an animator or I want to be a portrait artist or whatever it is. And it's just like, that is just not kind of maybe what you're meant to do. So what, like Robert was saying, try a bunch of things. And that's what I did to find animation. So don't force yourself to try to do anything. It will be hard. It will be really hard, but it will feel right. I think everyone here, animation feels right for them, even though it's hard work. There's a difference between hard work and just it not working. So definitely search, search your inner self about that. And it's a process like it all of high school I was just like trying to find what kind of art I wanted to do so it's been like nine years since the beginning of high school I guess wow that's crazy but um yeah so just like almost a decade I started probably late middle school like really thinking I want to do art and yeah a decade of just trying everything until you found what's right so yeah and maybe animation is right for you but um yeah try everything and yeah i think like one of my biggest things too is like i i very much had no idea what i wanted to do i knew i loved art like i liked drawing i was actually you know i went to college for music is what i did and i was teaching piano for years after high school and i the kind of the way that i found it out is doing animation I was at the end of like a long day of doing it I was like I could do this again tomorrow <laughs> but if I drew for all day I'd be like oh I don't want to draw for the next like two weeks yeah. or even I was that getting that way with piano which I loved at first but I would you know be teaching for all day or, or whatever I'd be teaching piano you know for eight plus hours a day and then at the end of the day I was like I don't want to do it tomorrow I'm done I'm, I'm sick of it but when I animate I can animate for 13 hours and like oh I didn't eat whoops animation and go back to it so I think it is really finding that like intuitive what what feels good of like if you feel like burnt out at the end of your average work day like it, is that for you or not just being able to really and ask yourself truly okay do I like the idea of animating because me I love the idea of drawing I was like oh I'd love to be a concept artist that would be the coolest thing ever and I would force and force myself right before I started AM to like try concept art and learn new things at the end of the day I was like I feel so drained and burnt out and I I had to force myself in a bad way. So that's important to listen to your intuition intuition of what feels right. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. I went to, I originally went to college for business because I thought I'm going to like, I want to run a company. I want to like be the CEO of Google someday. Like I had this <laughs> false like thing, like this false idea about myself that I was going to go be a businessman, uh, like own a company is going to be the best thing ever. <laughs> and I went to college for two years for business. And during that time, that was when I was teaching myself how to animate because I wanted to I wanted to own like a production company or something like because I wanted to be involved in that in that world. But the more and more I got involved with the actual art side of that, um, the more I started to um, hone in what I actually wanted to do, which was the actual art. I was going into business so I could be a part of the art industry, but I wasn't an artist yet. And, and I hadn't really started trying art. So I didn't know that that was like what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be in the world of it. So I thought, oh, well, I'm gonna be a business person because that's what you know I can do. And, um, and it wasn't until I started trying all these different things that I realized that business, like I don't wanna just sit in a production company doing the paperwork for a company. Like that's not what I wanna do. I wanna actually be making the thing you see on film. Uh, so that was, that inevitably, uh, that led me to to leave college to do uh, animation and yeah it, it just came with a lot of like like this is what I 
think this is what I know I'm going to do. And then this, like this little passion just growing inside of, inside of me that, that eventually took over. And I think as long as you're, you're staying open-minded to, to what you're, what, uh, I guess internally <laughs> your body's trying to tell you or your mind's trying to tell you, um, it's, you know, your, your real passion is going to come out eventually yeah. as you just open yourself up to all these different possibilities. For sure. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah. For me, it was like, I did, growing up, I always knew I liked 3D animation because for me, it looked cooler just for my taste than like 2D because it was like shiny and pretty and the renders and How to Train Your Dragon was my favorite. I was like, I want to make How to Train Your Dragon. And so I looked like, in my mind, the cool thing was making the characters. I was like, I want to make stoic. And like, I didn't really know what was in the 3D pipeline. I was just like, I want to make cool things and how to train your dragon is my favorite. So I want to make cool how to train your dragon. And so my mind all the way growing up was like, I want to make the characters. And so then whenever I actually graduated from high school and I started looking into it, I was like, how do you make characters? How do you do 3D? Da, da, da. And that was what I was looking for. But in doing the research, I found Animation Mentor and I was like, oh, moving the characters. That's so cool. And I signed up for AM and that's how I found the love for animation because I just started looking into it. And in looking into it and looking at the different pipelines, looking at the different things, I was like, ah, this is what I like to do. I thought it was this. I had this idea in my head that I wanted to do this, but looking at it now, I'm like, nah, I, no, I don't want to do sculpting. I don't want to do character design. No, that's, that's the way too artistic for like my sensibilities. Like, I'm not as artistic as most people. I'm much more of a technical person, but I use that to animate. And I'm slowly but surely growing my artistic side, but animation way better suits what I like than sculpting would have ever done. And it just takes looking at it and trying to figure out what works for you and what you like as well. And I think from like a practical advice side, because I like I mentioned earlier, like I very much came from the, I like art, but I don't know what I want to do. I like animation, but I don't know what part of it I want. Yeah. Don't commit. I think a big thing a lot of people are scared of because animation is so unknown. It's very much, you might find, you know, that one behind the scenes documentary, like movie short that was on one of your favorite animated films as a kid, like, oh, behind the scenes of Shrek. And then you see like, you know, the little tiny bits of the pipeline, but you don't really know until you actually start doing it. And now what's so cool, and I remember I did this before I started Animation Mentors, I, YouTube was my best friend, that finding little things, I would literally take a week, I basically was my own production manager, and I was like, okay, I'm going to learn every little bit of the pipeline, like, one or two weeks at a time, so, like, I taught myself sculpting for, like, a week, taught, <laughs> I watched YouTube videos and tried to follow along with, like, tutorials, I taught myself character design, I tried to teach myself concept art, I tried to teach myself environment, I tried taught myself modeling, character modeling, specific things, lighting, rendering, um, animation even. And what's cool now is there's so many free alternatives. You don't have to take an entire workshop to learn if you like that thing or not, which you may want to for more in depth of like, okay, do I want to do this thing forever? Or do I want to do it as a hobby? That can kind of decide, but there are so many different ways you can use Blender for free things just to teach yourself a little bit. You don't need to have Maya and a whole animation workshop to know if you like it or not. So I think that would be like my main advice is practically try little bits of things because there's so many free alternatives out there. You don't need to take a $2,500 class <laughs> to decide and then yeah. be in debt because of it or, you know, be out of pocket. So. Yeah, I did, I did something similar to where I took uh, the schoolism class and I think the Aaron Blaze school where yeah. they have just different, different classes, like a character design class, a a ZBrush class, a yeah. like all those different things. And that's when that's what I was doing when I was like really deep searching what I wanted to do. And yeah, that's around the time I stumbled across uh, an animation mentor. And mm -hmm. I took the the workshop, which was five hundred dollars, but I was I didn't know how <laughs> I didn't know how to do Blender. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that. So I, I personally only I found that the only way to try that. But yeah, I wouldn't commit more than more than that before you really know, before you've tried a lot of things. Yeah. So yeah. 
that's what I used the Aaron Blaze course too when I was like doing like concept art and stuff. And then yeah. I, I used Udemy for like this really weird blender course that was supposed to be like teach you everything, like how to do blender. And all I remember from it is the guy that taught it every five seconds after he'd say something, he'd say, pretty cool, pretty awesome. <laughs> Somehow like I hear that in my head. <laughs> Whenever I'm like animating, if I do something, I'm like, pretty cool. Pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great one by memory though. Yeah. That's yeah I I kind of went, went through a similar thing in terms of searching because for me, I'm way older than all of you probably combined. <laughs> and uh, I uh, basically started engineering. It wasn't for me. And then I moved on to a multimedia design because I was I really like doing websites. And when I was there, I got a taste of 3D and Tangled came out at a, that exact same year. And suddenly my mind went and I was like, oh, interesting. And that was kind of what led me because I was doing model. I, I was doing a little bit of everything, modeling, um, animation, lighting. So I kind of got it from there. But I wanted to touch on something that um, Taylor, you mentioned and Madison, you kind of mentioned as well, because you were, you were saying how there's not re there was not really that much about animation behind the scenes. And Taylor, you said how a lot of people have this fantasy of what the job is. So I wanted to ask you, because I think a lot of people have this idea of what working in animation is and maybe how was it for both of you when you started animating versus what you thought the job was going to be? Because there's a lot of really great things about working in animation. That's why we keep doing it. But yeah. there's also the reality that it's a job. Yeah. Um I was clueless going into animation in general. Like I didn't have, I didn't have a fan, I didn't have a fantasy about it. I didn't picture it to really be much. I will say though, maybe the one, the one thing I had was I watched the that John Lasseter like day in the life video where he like wakes up in his mansion and then there's like he. <laughs> He gets chauffeured in a in a limo to work at Pixar, and he has like an. What? IPad. That's not your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. No, yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's what Pixar and like. I thought I didn't know who he was. I thought every Pixar animator lived like that. I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll try to get good at that if someone <laughs> to get a mansion. I mean, that was my one thing that I was stupid about, and had a fantasy about. I guess. I thought that if you got to fix our, you would be chauffeured around and would have a mansion with a room with 6,000 Hawaiian shirts. But <laughs> I guess, yeah, I, I, I figured that out pretty much right away that that's not what's going on. But yeah, that was my little, I thought that everyone at Pixar were millionaires. So that was my <laughs> one thing. But other than that, I was, I didn't have a fantasy about it. I just wanted to do <laughs> I just wanted to do art that lots of people would see and that is realistic when you're an animator and it's it it's a very small percentage of people who get to do that if you think about it like it it is a big deal to people still like working at Disney is huge to people back at my like in my hometown like it is a big deal and I guess it's just yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what is your take? I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, when I when I first um, when I had the idea of animation, I was like, oh yeah, it'll be. Um, I didn't really under think about how I was going to do it technically. I just thought about like the result, which I, I don't know. It tends to be a thing with me, but <laughs> I just I tend to think about like the the final result and not and brush over like the how am I how am I going to get there part. So I got uh, I got the animation software thinking like, oh yeah, I'm going to make, um, I'm going to make all these things in my head and it's going to be great. And if I make it, because all the, all the animations, Minecraft animations I see on YouTube, they all have like 3 million views plus. So I guess if I make it, it'll just get 3 million views. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, so then it, you know, I, I started animating and I realized very quickly that like, there's a lot more to movement than, uh, than it seems. And, and that's when I started to look at everything differently. And uh, I, I started to feel like I was learning how to walk again. And I was learning how to how to move again. 
And it was like, it was on one side, it was really like, I, I felt like, I had been duped <laughs> by like this idea, but on another, it was like a fascination that was just, that was growing for me. And I think that, um, that fascination uh, is what led me to eventually want to do it for, for a living. And it was like, it, I think though that idea of like a fan of having this fantasy can work hand in hand really well with, with just the idea that, that you're going to get there no matter what, like the, your, your hard work mixed with, unrealistic fantasy is what takes you here because it's like that saying where you know if you if you reach for the for the stars um oh wow i forgot the rest of the of the <laughs> saying but you know if you reach for the stars you you're at least in space right you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's like if you if you reach for this unrealistic uh maybe unrealistic at the time goal but you you match it with really hard work you know you're going to land uh somewhere uh, further than what you expected, like than what you, no, you would have. Um, I think that, um, you know, when I going, I think you had mentioned like going into professional work as well with it. Um, like when, when you go into it, into a job, I feel like ever since I've been animating, uh, like on the road to, to being a professional, there's been these different like either misconceptions or just unrealistic ideas of that like when when I get my first job I've made it like I'm I'm this I'm an animator now and I am like everything's going to be amazing and it's going to be like I'm going to be a professional who can do anything but really it's just you know you're just taking taking steps to getting better and and animation you never you never finish learning as an animator you know, you get to a studio and the people there, including yourself, are just as as eager to learn as you are. And they don't know everything. You know, you meet you meet directors who or um, or you meet directors or, or supervisors or, or animators who you used to who you look up to like they're these just amazing people who like somehow breathe life yeah. into Zootopia. They Robert breathe life into into dragons. Um, but then you meet them and they're just, they're just people. They're people who have a passion for the same thing you did. And they just, they are on the same road as you and they took the necessary steps to get there. And I think the further you go in animation, the more you're breaking down those barriers of unrealistic uh, fantasy of what that job is. And in one way that can be really like, it could be upsetting to you because it's like, oh, it's not this fantasy world anymore but in another in another it's very fulfilling because it's this whole new world um for you that that is more it's a more realistic one a more down-to-earth one that you can really appreciate you can come to appreciate so you yeah know, i think it's just about about being humble and and matching your fantasies uh your your fantasies with hard work and that's just it's going to take you on a journey to me, Disney is a fantasy and it's everything that I imagined it to be and hoped it would be and been better in a lot of in a lot of ways. I don't know if I just didn't have an over the top expectation of it or unrealistic expectation of it, but it's really a dream job. Like it's I'm getting to do like I don't I just was thinking about this yesterday because it was Friday. I'm like at during high school or whatever, or when I had another like a totally unrelated job that I didn't like, you would be like, oh my gosh, it's Friday. Can't wait. <laughs> like it's Saturday. But uh, at Disney, I'm like, oh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Like it's all the same to me. Like I don't care. And sometimes the weekends feel weird. I'm like, I don't have, I don't know. It's just, it's, it just shows that if you love it, it's not, it's like the old saying whatever if you love what you do you never work a day in your life and that that is true for like the fantasy of disney and i'm gonna use disney as an example because disney and pixar those are like the big fantasy jobs people might not fantasize other like smaller not smaller just you know not the big not huge studio life um maybe they do and that sometimes those jobs can be very difficult and stressful and in different ways like that maybe do break your soul a little bit and <laughs> just 
so there is that but um yeah just realistic expectations and enjoy try to enjoy that you're getting to animate for a living and just try and use every experience to get better and grow from and yeah but i think i mean i think that when you're even at the big studios you're still everyone's still they're not as as perfect as you would imagine i i would Byron imagine is perfect oh yeah <laughs> besides Byron. legally she has to say no. <laughs> everyone's still everyone's still there to learn everyone's yeah. still learning everyone's still passionate in the same way that we were uh when we started am and you know it's just it, it, you can still feel like you're not working a day in your life but that doesn't mean it's not hard work it just means you're really passionate about it and it means that it doesn't feel like like you're wasting your life away on on a on a job that you don't want to be doing it just it feels like passion work which is it that is a different thing than, I, than just work i will say i've had several crying mm -hmm. on the floor meltdowns <laughs> during school and and the short film and i've yet to have that happen <laughs> in my whatever seven months at at disney so i mean i think they're the, th the difference between school and work is school is endless like you don't ha you if you it doesn't feel like you can have a break like you have to you feel like you have to work day and night or and when you're not animating maybe you feel guilty and it's just like this weird endless thing but at work it's like you have dedicated hours and then you they give you enough time they, they give you enough tasks to do in that time so you can you should be getting it done for like before the weekend or your due date and you can just feel relaxed most of the time. So yeah, it's less stress and less, so, sometimes it just feels less stressful and pressure, like less pressure as a whole for some reason working rather than being a student. So it's like kind of everything <laughs> great about animation and um, yeah, and at, at the big studios, you also have a team that just helps you with technical issues and you have a whole studio that knows like things like that. So you don't, you're not stressing about things like that. I know I dealt with that a ton in school where my, my scene would blow up and just be gone or the file would corrupt or just whatever. But at a studio, um, a lot of studios have help for you to, for them to like they will help you figure it out and usually their system doesn't allow for your scene just to disappear from existence so it's just taking out that technical level of stress helps me a lot you. oh my let me tell you about vfx well vfx is a little bit more <laughs> technical of it i remember specifically your class four shot where it like yeah. blew up and the the jaw was just like going oh, in infinite circles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that i definitely fun. had yeah meltdown with that because i was like paul it was my last week like i was about to final that and it just decided to blow up yeah yeah things like that is what broke me as an animator more so than anything <laughs> else like that is the that is the one thing that i was sometimes got worried about myself. Like if I could handle when like a shot would just disappear or it would blow up or it, like I, that was the biggest thing that was like, maybe I can't do animation, but it's gonna keep happening to me because I can't handle those stress levels of working three months straight on something and then for it to just go to hell basically. But yeah, that otherwise, if I now that that's pretty much gone, from my from my life at Disney, it's like I have been animating for the most part, but yeah, that's that's just something to look forward to when you get to uh, one of the studios that have that option. Mm -hmm. I would say like just to kind of like jump on to like the whole thing about fantasizing about the career or whatever of big studio whatnot one thing like I, I never necessarily had like an issue with myself of, like thinking about like oh the, the you know the big studios Pixar DreamWorks whatever with me it was more in between jobs <laughs> like I'd get a gig a contract and I'd be like this is great okay the next one's going to be the best one and then I'd start thinking myself out of 
even the reality of the job I'm working in. And I like stop appreciating like what I'm learning at that job. And I just think, oh, how much better the next gig is going to be or how much better the next contract. And that's a really dangerous like loop to get stuck in because then you don't come out with anything seemingly from whatever job you're working. So it's, it's kind of like the whole thing of appreciate the journey. Don't appreciate just the destination because you learn so much, no matter if it seems like a job that you're not, too happy about, or you're not necessarily animating, maybe you're doing something different. Maybe you're just a fixed artist. Maybe you're doing cleanup, you know, maybe it's not something that is your ideal situation, but you learn so much for each job. Don't get caught up in the fantasy of the next job or like what will be so much better because I I struggle with that a lot. Like, oh, the next job will be better. Next job I'll be doing feature. Next job will be a short film. Like just enjoy what you're doing. Try to just book into your site and just be like, okay, I'm doing this. This is cool. How much can I learn from this thing now? Yeah. While still after hours, still learning how to like work on your reel to get to where you want to go. That's a balance of like balancing goals versus being in the present. So always do your best at your current job. And and yeah, just like me right now, I'm in a weird middle ground where I'm assisting. I was an assisting animator on Encanto, but for the next project, the small project, I'm going to be an animator. And then I don't know what I'm going to be for the next film, if I'm going to stay uh, on crowds predominantly, which we do get to do shots, or if I'm going to be an animator, I don't know. It's like this weird like I can get in my head and think about it a lot. Like I just want to be, I just want to be a full animator, a full animator, <laughs> so I can, so I don't have to do any anything else but just animate shots. But I I just have to like just do my best with whatever I'm given and enjoy it because it's all really enjoyable. It's right. yeah, just not getting into the cycle. Yeah. See, we did have more questions. Let me kind of go on one that's kind of the same of what kind of what we're talking about. Um, someone asked how forgiving are studios on new hires or juniors who it may be their first job or their first experience. Um, um, I think that depends very much on where you are. But honestly, I feel like there's even as as a junior, there is an expectation of you um, to be able to animate and or give your all <laughs> to whatever is is given to you. Um, I haven't, in my uh, experience, I haven't seen a case where someone was a junior, but because they were a junior, they were given a lot of leeway. I think a good studio will start you small and they'll work you into, into it. Um, they're going to give you, as a junior, they're going to give you probably the easiest shots or the or at least the easiest schedule of the rest of the animators um, because they know that that you're a junior and they're going to utilize their mid and seniors uh, on on the more difficult stuff the more uh, time consuming stuff or give them the most packed schedule because um, they know that you know they're paying them for that so they're going to give them that and they also don't want to turn over their juniors but I don't think it's a good idea to have the expectation that they're going to go easy on you. I think it's best to think of it like I am a, I'm a junior animator. I have everything to prove and I'm I need to prove uh, I need to prove that I can do the job and I'm going to perform no matter what they give me. And if I don't, I'm going to go down trying because and maybe they'll understand, maybe they won't, maybe they'll say, well, this, this wasn't for you. But most of the time, um, if they hire you, they know that you can, you can replicate the work or you can, you can do the work. You just need to have your best attitude and do the best you can uh, on, on it and, you know, see what happens. They're going to give you tasks that you should be able to handle. Like they're not going to, they're most likely not going to give you like this really super hard shot they're gonna they're going to give you stuff that is either more simple or less important to the project and you you're expected to handle that like you have to be able to handle that but they're they will give you things that you should be able to handle like they're not they're going to assess what they're giving you they're not just going to randomly give you something and it could be super hard um if they're doing it right, which most studios do. And there is room 
for at the beginning, especially learning different, like if you can't just be expected to understand how the studio works, how the pipeline works, how whatever. So they're going to be hopefully be easy on you to learn the process of the studio and how everything works. Um, but yeah, you just have to just do your best and really make sure you're you're using your resources. Like maybe ask if they give you a buddy or if you have a friend, ask them before you're going to the the supervisors or heads of animation right away and bothering them. Like try and figure stuff out on your own. And if you absolutely can't, then go ask for help. Um, yeah, a lot of people just like don't know something and then they ask. And then it was really easy. They just didn't try. And then you end up getting the, someone who's asking you 10 questions a day. Yeah. And that's when it's going to seem a little, just it's going to be a little bit bothersome and kind of show that you're not, not even trying really. So try and do everything to the best of your abilities and then ask for help if you, if you really can figure it out, but yeah. They, I think that's good advice because I, I've heard a lot of people when they say like, you know, it's they haven't done as great as they thought they would being a junior or they get let go like early on. I hear them always tell me like, I didn't talk to the people I needed to. I didn't talk to people when I needed help. Like they tried to just keep doing it because they're almost embarrassed to ask for help. But that's the whole point why you're a junior, right? Is they know that you're going to need a little bit of hand holding, but yeah. try to do the most yourself, right? It's finding a balance of when, like when you yeah. need to ask like I, if I, I would, like I said, I would try and figure out something on my own or ask more of the people on my level peer, peer wise. And then if I couldn't find it out, I would like, I would go and ask, like, I wouldn't wait two days if I tried for 30 minutes and can't figure it out. So it's finding that balance of when to ask and who to ask. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. We have another question. What is your, both of your favorite thing about working at your studios? What do you guys enjoy the most about your studios, your job currently? Uh, for me, I love seeing, I love seeing my work lit and rendered and then released. Like um, a, a good example, I get, I think would be um, like most recently I went with the, with the release of Loki. I didn't actually get to work on it because I came in right at the tail end of it. But that was the first time that I went to the mall and saw big posters and big advertisements and merch of, of uh, Miss Minutes uh, everywhere. And I thought that was just really, really cool. And it made me really uh, uh, excited about, about my studio. Um, it's and then, feel real. <laughs> yeah, it makes it feel feel real. But another thing is like with with um, when I've been working with Enchanted Mob, uh, their their videos uh, will sometimes just blow up. And like one of the one of the first videos I worked on was this uh, was this one called "Don't Come Crying." It was this music video uh, in the Five Nights at Freddy's world, and that video may, got sixty. It's like it's sixty five million views. And that, I mean, just seeing that was like, like just ridiculous to me because like for me coming, like I wanted to be a YouTuber, like when I first started animating in Minecraft and like I, no one watched my videos, I got like, <laughs> for 200 video, views per video uh, that I slaved away at for like a year on, right? And, uh, but like, you know, just seeing your work just lit and rendered for me of, of any job so far has been the most rewarding thing. And then seeing the people who, who appreciate it the most, like, like um, it, it really gave me another, a new understanding of, of how my work is affecting people. Like my, my work uh, will inspire people. Like a lot of the people that watch uh, these Minecraft uh, stuff are kids and a lot of them want to be animators and they start with Minecraft animation just like I did. And they look up to the work that we do um, at Enchanted Mob. And, and that really, after putting out, after our first, my first video I worked on came out, I really started to think about it. Like these people are, are looking at my work for inspiration and I, I really want to, to perform. So that, that just really helped push me, uh, push me more and more to work harder and to really, you know, it, it made me put a whole new, uh, new level of, of, 
uh, eyes on my work because I knew other kids are going to see this, other people are going to see this, and they're going to be inspired by it, like I was when I was young, um, younger and first getting into animation. And I think that's probably my favorite thing about about my job. Mine is the free dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Next <question>. priorities. <laughs> <laughs> priorities. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is great. Um. No, my favorite thing is the. I think just the team being on the, the the team at Disney where everyone is just super, super driven, super talented and passionate and really a team. Like we will definitely like always trying to help each other out because we're working on something in unison. Like it's a team project. So we're really just all there to make this thing the best we can. And I just really like that camaraderie of everyone. And everyone is just really nice and funny and just, like I said, trying to do their best to create this great thing that will, that a lot of people will see. And I do, I do really love that, that thought of like millions of people will see what we worked on. I haven't experienced that yet, so we'll see, but I think it's just a cool feeling of a team making something that's going to then go out to the entire world and hopefully become something iconic. And you'll see to little kids dressing up as the characters and toys and posters and Disney, like Disney World rides and everything. It's just really mind-blowing but yeah just the whole team effort is what I really enjoy about working at Disney and the a team of some of the best people in the world like in all not just animation but artists and voice acting and editing just everything it's like the, it's the best of the best and it's just being a part of that is incredible so yeah and the free dinner. <laughs> but, you know, that, that's all great, but. <laughs> and the, yeah, and the random free ice cream. Yeah, that's great. Exactly. That's the real reason. If you want a goal to get into features, it's the free dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to work like 60 hours a week for the free dinner, but like, it's cool. Okay. That's free <laughs> fine. Worth it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I heard DreamWorks has free breakfast and lunch. Sign me up. Yeah, DreamWorks mm. is even better. I think they always exactly. give it to you. Yeah. My goal of which studio I want to be is based on how much free food I get. Yes. <laughs> That's my, you have any questions for us, Madison, at the interview? Um, what's my food budget? What do you think? <laughs> That's the only question. Good question because, I mean, hey, if they feed you, more time for you to animate. Exactly. I'll work more. If you give me a croissant in the morning, I will work <laughs> six hours extra each week. Oh, Disney you're parent. cheap for only wanting a croissant. <laughs> one I don't ask for much, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe once I get into feature, I'll start asking for more, but you know. Yeah. Disney has a bagel Fridays or something. Oh, of course, that doesn't exist right now. I heard that got canceled. Yeah, well, apparently, well, it didn't, it didn't get canceled. Obviously, the pandemic, they don't have it, but the people who are at the studio, like the small group, apparently they handed out bagels in separate plastic bags to everyone. Oh, that's, so sad. Sad. that's so sad. Yeah, oh. it was sad. Sanitary but, bagels. Yeah. Just throw them. Yeah, they threw them at that's them. Funny. Yeah. Well, I think that's all that we have for questions. So maybe we can take the last few bits of time that we have with you guys to talk about the rig, because a lot of people were asking questions about yes. What's the rig? So I know Daniel has some uh, images and stuff. So maybe you can show things, share screen, whatever you need to do. Sorry so. if you hear our doggy in the background. He's getting mad at us. For, <laughs> okay. for if, 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 if he wants to join, yeah. he, yes. <laughs> I mean, he would probably be naughty, although yeah. he's he's not feeling well. He still has oh. his cone on. Yeah, from he the baby. <laughs> cone of shame. Yeah. He's, he's a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> the cone of bravery. Yeah, we call it the cone of bravery. I like that better. <laughs> it's a little more dignified. <laughs> to start into the rig stuff, so this started, I'm going to say a year ago. And basically, I can't remember if we were talking with you guys or I had the idea and I started talking to you guys, but basically, I mentioned like it would be cool to make a rig. 
because I was getting frustrated at like either the rigs are at a specific school and you have to take that school to get the rigs or the rigs that you can find on the open market don't have the typical specific controls that I like or don't have the best concept art or design and like different rigs have different issues that I was like I would love to have a rig that was just exactly what I wanted and Taylor and Robert at that time were working with a studio making some rigs and stuff like that and they were like we would love to do that too and so we just started talking and it just kind of spurred an idea in my head that I talked to Sin about Madison Taylor and Rowe and I kind of just started researching the business aspects of it. And then here we are a year later and we're making a rig. And it started with Taylor doing the concept art. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about you doing the concept art. But it kind of goes back to you talking about you tried to do concept art. Then you became an animator. <laughs> and now you're an animator doing concept art. <laughs> yeah, I just draw whatever people want me to. Like, I'm used to that. I'm just kind of like a drawing machine then <laughs> people are like i need this i'm like i like to draw and i i'll do it for you i'm just really i i still love drawing it's just um not as fulfilling for a career for it, but i love doing it um so yeah we 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 got a pinterest board together of kind of what we thought would be super appealing and thing designs that we wish that we that they had because a lot of rigs out there are like super stylized maybe, or just maybe, maybe the modeler and rigger is really good, but the, the design isn't quite, quite as good as you would hope, or it's not meant, it wasn't done by an animator. So things that animators think about like eye shape might be not super easy to deal with. So we just wanted to come from an animation, we're all anim animation background and make a rig that's great for an animator and yeah so we got a lot of pinterest boards together and what we wanted and we were thinking about what kind of age we would want and we kind of came up with a like preteen teen like 13 12 to 15 ish kind of age which we haven't seen a ton of and yeah we went from there and took a lot of inspiration from diff some of our favorite characters or um, concept art a lot of it was based off of young leonardo dicaprio and a lot of disney stuff um the iron giant uh everything like that just like some of the most appealing characters that we all love and kind of yeah. combined it into a character that we can yeah. actually animate in three in three d since come to life kind of the the goal we all kind of talked about when we were first talking about the rig was that we want to create a bunch of rigs and we want to create the diversity of stuff that we don't see different races, different age groups, different body sizes. Like as animators, if you look at what's out in the market that are good rigs, it's very, very small, um, small, like the variety of what you can animate. And so our goal was like, okay, you have little kids, you have grown up, but there are no like mid teenage young teenage rigs mm -hmm. and like we have a whole lot of ideas of the next rigs we're trying to do that's why we're that's why we're charging for this rig as opposed to making it free because we want to pay the best people to make these rigs right we don't want to try to just throw it together ourselves and have it not be the best we are paying out of pocket some of the best artists in the industry to make these rigs so that they are the best rigs we can make and we want to make as many of them as possible with the same rig structure. So you're not opening up a rig and being like, okay, how the heck do I animate this? What controls do you have here? What controls yeah. do you have here? We want them all to have the same rigging structure. We want them to be simple, yet able to do anything you want it to do. And we want to, in the future, with the more rigs we make, is different body types, different ethnicities, different age ranges. We want to make as many different we can. And in the future also branching out into different styles. And so um, the first one we decided on just because we already kind of had an idea of what we wanted was this teenage rig, but we have a whole bunch of ideas in the future, but I'm gonna go ahead and switch here. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see this. This is, you know, Taylor, you can kind of talk about this, but this was your exploration of different 
kids <laughs> based on oh, our Pinterest. Oh, we're not um, seeing anything. Oh. Oh, you might need to check it in. I have to look at the stream. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> There it is. I was just going to say late. right before um, to add on to what Dan said is that um, at least a big pro a big thing I've noticed with rigs that are available to the public is that they're all so stylized that it makes it really hard to just um, to put together a scene that's just um, that's I guess consistent and our goal um, and something I, I would really love to see in, in a rig is a character that's more just anatomically correct and um, more of a, of a Disney style where you're mixing uh, realistic proportions uh, with a cartoony and appealing uh, character. A character best way I can describe our... This big. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or this big. Um, <laughs> like the best way to describe it is just like, he's solid. <laughs> like he just looks yeah. solid. Like yeah. he doesn't look, you know, Flimsy. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's nice to have a rig that you could practice weight. That's not a stick or it's hands and or light arms and legs look like two little pencils, like, or mm -hmm. gigantic head that you have to balance or like, it's just nice to have a solid rig that, like you said, anatomically yeah. correct that yeah. you can Which, practice that, with. That intent will be, yeah, it'll be great for practicing with and, and getting to learn uh, anatomy. Yeah. So. And something that I love that Taylor did with this amazing designs is that it doesn't look like every other rig <laughs> out there it looks special for me that is what makes me love this rig so much yeah um but yeah for the for the initial sketches i we already had an idea of what we wanted and like we use a lot of reference from everywhere and we kind of like wrote a list of everything we want from it so these are just like really the only initial sketches i did just kind of I have a doodle and then I'd send a picture to them, ask them what they think, and we'd change little things. And that's why it's really scribbly and kind of <laughs> ugly. But uh, yeah, it was just kind of our initial idea. And then from from this, I would just go in Photoshop and do a little bit more exploring and then pretty much just tie it down right from there. But yeah, you can see kind of we or we talked about like the hairstyles and I have like a couple different hair ideas and um, talked about like just the profile and what can make that better. And then, yeah, then we went to these where we did started doing a turnaround of kind of our final character and making sure it's everything we wanted. Yeah. And, and something that yeah. was interesting that you told me when we were working on this is that for the initial exploration sketches, you make sure that you draw on crappy paper. That way you don't get attached to it. Because if you do it digitally or on nice paper, you, you're you scared to like do crappy ideas to start out with. And you just try to make I, it perfect on the first try. Yeah, I have a pretty good, I have a pretty good quality about me where I don't care about my drawings. Like most people are really like care about their drawings. I probably just have done so many in my life that I just do not care anymore. <laughs> so I I just take any old sketchbook I have, scribble it, <laughs> throw it to the side now. I used to have a problem where I'd be like, every sketchbook has to be for certain things, but yeah, get if you- Any old sketchbook. <laughs> Y'all should see how particular she is with her sketchbooks. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm OCD about some things, but also just completely just, Throw, will throw away drawings and stuff but yeah using a ugly cheap sketchbook is great for coming up with ideas yeah and the thing i loved so much whenever she sent those first passes is i had an idea in my head based off the concept art or the pinterest board we made of like what i was imagining and when she sent it i was like this is the guy that was in my head. Like I didn't have the I didn't have the mm -hmm. mental image in my head of what he looked like. And exactly. your brain is pretty scary. I don't yeah. want to ever go there again. <laughs> <laughs> but then, like she sent the concept, I was like, "This is him." Like I love this kid. Yeah. He looks yeah. so appealing and so special and so nice. And so, we obviously went from there into like these more colored uh, turntable. So that we could 
send it off to the modeler because at that point once we started doing concept art i was like oh shoot i need to find a modeler because i was reaching out to certain people that i thought would do it but then they ended up not being able to do it so then i just put out on linkedin like i was like hey i'm looking for a modeler i my my goal was also like i it annoys me a lot whenever freelancers or indie people try to hire talent for cheap because they don't have a big budget and me being a freelancer i'm like i'm going to pay the standard i'm going to pay people what they want what they need and i'm going to make sure that you know this is the best rig we can make so i put out there i was like hey looking for a modeler to do some work for me and i started just sifting through i think it was like 50 60 different reels of people all trying to model this character and i ended up finding an extremely talented modeler named kartik kinnair and he bid the project i really liked his work we ended up bringing him onto the team and he's been fantastic so far so taylor put these together for him because we wanted to start off with just a base body that way we can go all the way down to like a swimsuit or whatever you want for your character and then we're gonna we we're in the process of finalizing clothing models that we're going to have him model out but we wanted it to be able to go all the way down to the bottom because we're it annoys me a lot whenever you have a rig and you're like oh this is a really cool rig i want to give him different clothing and you take the clothes off and it's just nothing underneath and you're like well now i'm just stuck to these you know weird clothings that doesn't match my idea at all superhero outfits yeah (laughs) (laughs) so not naming names yeah (laughs) So these were amazing um, concept yeah. sketches that Taylor did. And then we moved on to the teeth. Taylor was very specific with how she wanted the teeth because a lot of teeth models are... Piano keys. <laughs> yeah, just solid geo or really weird. So if you want to talk a little bit about what you wanted in the teeth. Yeah, I, I really like Artemis and Apollo's teeth where they have like se- like segmented teeth it's uh just makes the characters look a lot just more real i guess rather than having just a white block in the mouth so yeah i mean just using kind of what real teeth look like and simplifying them a little bit um so they're not like individual they shouldn't be like individual that might make for some weird shapes but like having there be like different shape rather than just a bar is what what we wanted so hopefully that will be ideal to animate yeah but yeah and then actually late last night or the night before i don't know it's been such a blur we ended up getting some final clothing so this is the clothing design we wanted it to be fairly generic we wanted it to be fairly um typical for a kid of this age but we also wanted it to be nice and like flexible and so we ended up just with a nice pair of blue jeans some what did you call them? High top? High top. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no respect. <laughs> and just like a nice white t-shirt. So another goal that I had, because I don't know how many of you people are here from AM, but I made hundreds and hundreds of mods for AM students and different people in the community. So my goal is taking this rig. We're going to have an initial clothing <clears throat> mod that comes with the character but i'm just gonna start immediately coming out with different mods and i may even open up in the community of channel box or wonderwell of just requests and i'm just gonna start making clothing mods and i'm gonna make them very very cheap they're gonna be two dollars two dollars fifty cents three dollars something like that and i'm just gonna start making as many mods for this character as i can because that's something animators typically don't have the skill set for and don't have the time for you want to animate a shot of a pirate you want to animate a shot of you know a kid in this setting this setting you don't want to have to think about modeling the character yourself and so my goal is just to make as many mods for this character as you possibly can so that whenever you animate this character and you have an idea for him you can go to our page and you'll find exactly what you need and it will be very very affordable that way it's letting you spend your time animating and not as much time trying to make him fit within a scene if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so there will be many many mods coming in the future i've also hired some very talented surfacing artists to texture and make these clothing and character very appealing so that they are render ready if you want to render them so yeah super cool 
these are a little bit out of order, so I'm gonna go to this one, but then we got our first modeling pass from Kartique on the character, and I think we all kind of flipped out when we first saw him in 3D because we'd been working with this character so long in 2D, and then we saw him in 3D and we were like, our son. <laughs> <laughs> this is our son, and now he's in 3D, and now we can see what he looks like. And it was so exciting, and like, <clears throat> we obviously had some notes Taylor's done a, a crazy, stupid, good job of, like, giving notes to critique and making sure it stuck with the character design. And he already looked appealing on this first pass, but Taylor went through and, like, here's some notes she gave on the hands. Super detailed, super nice, amazing notes on the hands. But he was a little too round, I think. We all saw him on the first time. We were like, this is amazing. This is an amazing base. But he's a little too round, so we gave some notes on the hands on the body we wanted him to be a little more trim a little more fit in the body area and so taylor just went through and just did a lot of drawovers and made him yeah something super... yeah go ahead i like to do when we're when i'm working with the modeler is i'll just go into photoshop and i'll take the liquefied tool or whatever it is and just like mold it to what i want what i would want it to be mm -hmm and just go from there and show them be able to flip between like what it should look like and what it currently looks like yeah it's a nice tool yeah i think i may have gotten some of those but i may have not so it did look yeah. really amazing because like she did that and i was like that's the character because it still looked 3d but it was the way we wanted it and along with that she did a ton of drawovers and gave a lot of amazing notes going through oh there it is so yeah yeah so she just went in with the liquefied brush and just like took the character from 3D and just modded it to what we wanted. And then from there, Kartik did a second modeling pass. Uh, we also added a lot of notes on the face. And this is the character that we got on second pass. So we've gotten a lot of amazing notes from our rigor on topology. We know the topology is not perfect right now. So that's the next step for our modeler. We had a couple small notes that we wanted changed on the body. And we have a lot of notes on topology just for rigging purposes. But this is close to our final product on the character's face and body. And I can say for all of us, I think we're more than excited about what he looks like now. Yeah. Look at how good he looks! Amazing! <laughs> and so kind of what I said when I saw him was I was like, when you watch like feature breakdowns of animators animating feature films in the viewport, and they do like play blasts and they show what it looks like before the render. This is what, like, he looks like a character from a feature film before it was rendered. And like, that's what gets me so excited about it because I'm like, we're going to see some feature quality shots done with this character rig. And it's not going to have to be blend shaped and sculpted and this <laughs> and that and all these different things animators have to do for rigs to get them to do what they want. We got in my opinion, from researching one of the best riggers out there to rig our character. Um, I don't know if anybody here has seen the Yulon rig or the Amanda or Thomas rig. He's an extremely talented rigger named Artem, and he will be rigging our character. And the thing we love about his rigs is that everything is scalable, rotatable, and translatable, which gives you so much... Um, Very flexible. Yeah, flexibility as animators to work and rig with it so yes his facial blend shapes will be really really nice we've already been doing some tests with it uh, i can actually open up maya because we have the model that is actually inside of maya so this is kind of what he looks like in the viewport we're getting some surfacing artists to make this arnold ready so you're going to get this character he'll look great in the viewport and if you want to render it you're just going to be able to put in lights and render it like, you're not going to have to set up shaders yourself because we're going to get some surfacing artists to do that. But these were just some quick render t uh, rigging tests that Artem did in, I think, 15 minutes just to test the topology. So this is by no means what the final rig's going to be. But you can already see some nice, flexible, like, deformations. And there are no blend shapes on this yet. This is just skinning. So this is going to be an insanely good rig. I'm so excited about it, and it's been like a, a kind of a dream come true because we've all wished we had amazing rigs, and now it's been 
hard from the business side because for anybody who knows has started a business, it's scary and it's hard because it's like, dang, there's so much paperwork and I've had to talk to lawyers and lawyers are expensive and I've had to have the savings to put this out myself. But after all this work and having this great team, like, again, that was what we were talking about with groups is like, if I didn't know Taylor, this wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> because she's done all the concept art and like knowing good artists and the modeler and the rigger and once we get into the more rigging side animation side like that's where me Cynthia and Madison and also Taylor too and Robert because they're both animators as well but we've had several long discussions about okay what do we want in this rig because so many rigs are made by riggers they're not the most animator friendly right because there's so many controls that seem cool on the concept but we know from application aren't that cool like we've all had issues where rigs riggers get beyond themselves and rig something super cool but you're like i hate this so much just make it simple so i can animate it and so we've had i think two or three like hour two hour long conversations where we're like okay do we want this control no that's not worth it yes we want this control because this is worth it and we put together an entire spreadsheet of animator friendly controls that we wanted to tweak and we gave that to the rigger and he was like cool we can we can do this so you're gonna see some really awesome tests because we're all gonna test this rig out once it gets released make sure that it works really really well before we ever release it and it, I, i'm super 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 excited about this and it's gonna be yeah awesome. i can't wait to animate <laughs> and to to add what you were saying about all the, the discussions we had about the rig, keep in mind that all of those discussions are also about the rigs that we use at work. Yeah. So we're talking about some like feature quality rigs, things that we liked, things that we didn't like. So we're trying to make this basically we're trying to make it the best for us so that it's the best for you. Yes. And also to answer a quick question about we'll be maybe making this a blender rig. We've talked about it and we're thinking about applying it right now. As I said, we're very small, limited budget. The goal is to release this for Maya and we're going to try and put it out there for as many people as we can so that we can, you know, make a profit and use that profit for more things. And one of the top things on our list is if this rig does well, we want to make it for Blender. And you tell everyone to buy it. And then yeah, every, if you guys buy it, enough, <laughs> we will make a Blender rig because, um, you know, we have some good friends that worked at Tangent. We've, you know, the entire studio shutting down that was Blender focused. It would be amazing. What we've talked about is we could find someone from Tangent that's a rigger that we could do that or just it's someone who rigs in general because it's very hard to find feature quality Blender artists because there's not a lot of feature quality Blender studios around. So being able to find the right artist is going to be difficult that we're going to, we're in the works of trying to find and also having the budget so that we can release this for Blender 2 is in our goal. Because our goal is to allow this for anyone to use, right? So Blender, Maya, we want you to be able to animate a feature quality rig. So that's in the goal. We don't know much about this yet, but that's 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 the goal in the future. Yeah, and this, this rig is just the, the start for us. Like Dan was saying, we want to then make more rigs, more mods, and like we might even branch out further than that. Um, we, we just want, want to see where this one rig takes us and try and build, build up a studio from there. So Yeah, and we have a lot of really, really cool ideas that if we have the chance we're going to put into action because I was talking to them. I was like, right now we're kind of limited to the voice actors and amazing talent for audio clips as students that we can use because certain voices, certain ethnicities don't fit with the rigs that we have. And so you're missing out on so many talented artists that you can use for your animated shots. We want to really just branch out to where we remove this whole thing of good rigs being unattainable you have to pay three thousand dollars for this school to get these good rigs or you have to pay this much we want to make so many rigs and so many feature quality rigs that if you hear an amazing voice talent or amazing audio clip 
we'll have a rig that matches that voice, right? And we'll have mods that match your idea. And we have just a whole array and affordable. The, this rig will be very affordable. We're still working on pricing. I think it's going to be priced anywhere from 20 to $25, which is way more affordable than a lot of the rigs that are out there, but will be enough that I feel like we'll be able to make a profit to make more rigs. So that's kind of the price we're going to be looking at. And we're, if you want, please follow the Instagram, share it, do anything you can to get the word out because the more people that know about it, the more people that buy, the quicker we're going to make a turnaround to make more rigs. So that's kind of our goal. It's like, I'm tired of artists not having the tools they need to make what they want. So I'm trying to give that out there for, so everyone can have feature quality animation tools so that they can make the best shots that they can. So you're muted, Taylor, if you're talking. <laughs> Oops. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, it'll, it'll be really great for student animators who are just beginning as well, because a lot of rigs that, that are available aren't appealing from the start. And they are, you have to like tweak their eye shape and everything just to start from, which it's good to learn that. But I think there's something really great about just having a rig that has base appeal that you don't have to completely mod first and then start. And a lot of animators don't even kind of realize that you should be like taking the eyelids from default and making them different and it's just going to be easier for beginner animators to just start from and start with an appealing base rather than yeah. having to try and fix a rig. And just for ease of animating, like even me, like I, you know, I think all of us, we've all been animating for a long time. It's way easier to have three controls that do a lot than to have 20 that can get, do the same yeah. thing because you have so many, like there's certain facial rigs out there that have just so many facial controls you can't keep up with them and you have to move this one and this one and this one and then you move to the next pose and you have to move all of them again and it gets very tiring and so extra curves that you have to deal with our goal with this one was let's make as few controls as we can but still be able to do everything because if you have one control you can move here and it looks perfect then you're great or yeah. if you want to scale it in as opposed to moving three micros that can do the same thing scaling it is just one more action and so this rig will be simple for the most beginner animators who are just learning facial posing but complex enough that the most advanced animators can still do everything they want to do with it so any yeah. of usually like the good rigs out there that we all know that we like to use but like have one or another issue with them are made by animators or yeah. an, an animator one <laughs> so we're hoping like with this rig having all of us on board that we're all animators full time it will help make it the best it can be because we're thinking about it from an animator's perspective rather than just a rigger or just a modeler that wants to make a rig. So, cause there's so many very specific things that you need as an animator or want that a lot of times isn't addressed. So we're hoping that will give us an up on, since we're none of us are riggers and being able to actually make a rig that we want to use cause we know what we would want in either jobs or personal shots, so. Yeah, exactly. And there will be a lot of things in the future that we're trying to do with this rig of like, we have some naming ideas, but we also want to involve the community around. So we watch out for the Instagram for posts. We are going to be having like naming suggestions in the near future where we're trying to get the word out as much as we can. So we're going to make a post saying, hey, give us idea names for this rig and you guys can comment down below. And if we like the name, we're going to put together some top ones we're going to vote and so you guys will have the ability to have input on the name of this rig and different ideas of the future of if we have two or three concept ideas that we all really like we may post it out to you guys and be like which concept art do you guys like best of these three characters and we'll have voting competitions to where you can help decide what we're making because in the end it's going to be made for you guys and so again plugging the instagram follow it because a lot of amazing stuff is going to be out there in the future so with that 
if there are no more questions, I think we can end the stream here. I think that's been one of the most fun streams we've had so far. Like, And that's amazing coming from, you know, we interviewed Ray Ross last week, and we all love Ray, but this yeah. has been super yeah, fun. Thank you. So. thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks for being and we here. will definitely have you guys on in the future. So. Yeah, for sure. You guys are all great. We, we, uh, we love these people. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, again, follow all the links. Follow Taylor and Robert. They're always doing awesome mm -hmm. stuff. Follow us so you know when we go live. And we will see you guys next week for critiques and awesome stuff next Saturday. We haven't exactly decided what we're doing next Saturday, but we're either going to interview somebody or we're going to do some sort of really cool demo. So and we'll just before we go, hostage again, you know? yeah. <laughs> before we go, if anyone has suggestions on who they want us to interview, yeah. if we can make it happen, we'll make it happen, but feel free to post them on our Instagram, on our Discord, or if you have any demos that you want to see, let us know. Yep. Thank you guys for coming. Thank and we'll you. see you next Thank time. You. Thank you so see much. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.